inspiring stories, all of them. And I think a uh, couple of things I think uh, that stood out. Uh, Shivan, you mentioned uh, you know the S's, you know scalable, speed, sustainability. Uh, so the thing that struck me was sustainability. So as you're growing now, you started off in UP, you're now here. How do you address that, or what are your thoughts on you know looking at sustainability as the organization grows? Um, can I preface that with Absolutely. a comment on his? Uh, we run uh, an organization that is ready to experiment of any healthcare conceptual solution or gadgetary solution you have. We have access to two million people from concept to execution is one month. We designed it that way. So I'm inviting all of you, including him, you want to experiment, see what works, what doesn't work. Our platform is ready for you anytime. Uh, like I said, two million population, Statistically valid data, we'll collect the data for you, feed it back, retweak it, do whatever you want to do. At the end of it, prove or disprove the model. And we've done in, like I said, 25 uh, modules of healthcare, including healthcare finance. I'll come to that in a minute. Something very exciting has happened. And we've done health IT in place in UP, but there's no electricity, no connectivity. Because we've got to solve the problems in real time as they exist and not dream for a utopia when the politicians get less corrupt, when the potholes are created, when the global warming doesn't happen, then I will come and do the healthcare. It doesn't work that way. The real things. So we are here to help you and create any other model in the audience. That's number one. Number two, to me, whichever way you cut it, sustainability is positive cash flow. If you're positive cash flow, you're sustainable. We are ashamed to say that word because it's kind of shameful word to say that you want to make profits. Unfortunately, in healthcare for the poor, there is no positive cash flow. Healthcare, nowhere in the world, can be sustained only by either insurance companies or rich for the poor or young for the old or healthy for the sick. Government subsidy as a part of social justice system in an egalitarian society has to come in. The key is, how can we keep costs low that become sustainable with minimal investment? That's where the cost of healthcare comes in. So we raise our own funds only in the beginning. For example, we run 16 free clinics there, free in the sense, again, to do a cost model, to find out exactly what is the cost of transaction. So we give all free medicines, all free consultations. It's a walk-in thing. Surprise, surprise, the cost per transaction for any comer that goes in averaged out is 12 rupees. In other words, at 12 rupees, I break even. That's my cost of delivering healthcare. We see 150,000 patients a year. So now if I charge 14 rupees, I make profit on this. The problem is, when you see the government system, they spend at least 10 times that money to, to, for the same outcomes. To me, scalability will come if we keep the cost low and the government and the philanthropists subsidized to an extent. I want to give you one more line. Like I said earlier, we work in advocacy and something fantastic is happening because being in healthcare, I said we've got to do two things in the country to make it cheaper and inexpensive. And now working with the higher echelons, two things we started five years ago, give a national health IT infrastructure. That should be the base bone, which is happening now. NIC is developing the software, it'll be cloud-based, given free to all the, all the doctors in the country, just upload it, that's number one. Number two, healthcare finance is what drives healthcare wherever in the world. So how do you deliver healthcare to 1.2 billion people, which I said earlier can't be done without government subsidy. So we're working on a thing called universal health coverage that the government of India will provide health insurance for every Indian, poor, middle level, rich level. It's part of the 12th plan, which is just started, was just starting. 1.83% of the GDP will go as health premium insurance for the government, go up to 3% 15 years later. It'll be phenomenal. The 1.2 billion people of the world will be covered from primary to tertiary care, one form or the other. It's already been accepted principle. We are working on the uh, creating pilot studies. We'll do three pilot studies. I'm deeply involved in this. Thank you. That's really exciting uh, news. Uh, Adam, uh, Adam, uh, you, have, you come from a different uh, f focus and different scale also. How do you all think in terms of sustainability or you know, what is your perception of keeping things going over there for KSV? Well, I guess the main thing for our, our sustainability because we provide a, a, 
a free education, it's a, a financial sustainability, that we find a, a financially uh, sustainable model. And this is not something we want to do by uh, putting some of our students to, to different tasks where they do something to generate some income. We feel that, you know, it's their childhood, it's the, it's the time they should be learning. They need to concentrate on that. It, it, it's our responsibility to get more into fundraising and it's building uh, long-term partnerships with our funders that is going to enable us to, to scale up should we, should we want to scale up. But when we look at growth, we can, we can look at that on, uh, on two ways. One is in terms of quantity and one is in terms of quality. And for sure at the moment, <coughs> we're, we're focusing much more on quality. We're, we're looking at what, <coughs> excuse me, we're looking at what we have and we're, we're trying to improve on that. And uh, <coughs> we're trying to have uh, improve better services, improve our processes, provide uh, better facilities to our students. And alongside uh, funding, which is a, a challenge to our growth, also uh, human resources is another, ch another challenge. And this is something that is very much l also linked to, to, to funding. As we're a, a, a modest, uh, small NGO, uh, we have a, a limited amount of funds coming in. It means that you know our, our salaries are also quite modest. It's difficult for a, a small NGO of our size to uh, to compete with the government. The government they are, they offer very nice sal salaries. They offer a lot of fringe benefits. A lot of people are going going for this for the job security. Perhaps it, it might not be as fulfilling uh, as working in an organization like ours, but it's very difficult for us to compete with that. And over the years, we have lost some of our staff that they've gone across to the government stream. It means that then we have a fresh batch of staff come in. Again, we have to, to, to do staff training, capacity building. So uh, the challenges to, to our growth are, are, are funds and, and human resources, which again, I think are inextric uh, inextricably linked. Stephen, you uh, obviously you all have been around a while in, in a number of countries. Have you all come up with any innovative kind of public-private partnerships or approaches either in the U.S. or elsewhere that has helped you all scale? Um, yeah, when we think about scalability, there's kind of three elements. There's programmatic, advocacy, and financial. Programmatic, we don't ever go to a school that's, that doesn't put something in. They may put in time, they may put in money. So we don't want to convince them to educate kids who are blind because it won't be sustainable then. We'll do the training, uh, we'll leave, six months later they won't be doing anything. So they have to be committed in some way and put some resources in, so whatever that is. The second thing is parents. Parents are a key element. If we can empower parents, they then will, will be the ultimate educators for kids, but they also will be the ultimate advocates in the government. Um, they'll have a lot more power than I will, than the local school administrator and the teacher. So we spend a lot of time educating parents about the potential there um, and letting governments know about the opportunities. And then the third is financial. Um, for every, we have 300 partners around the world in the 67 countries, and of those, for every dollar we invest, they collectively put in nine dollars so that they put up a lot. That's not every partner every year, but collectively, so that we try to find that sustainability, help them. Uh, so one of the things we may do is we may do a seminar for a local school on how they can do fundraising. So it's not part of our official job, but to get them going as, as part of that element. And so there's an educational a sustainability, there's an advocacy sustainability, because ultimately we want the government to take responsibility. Um, I'll never forget, I've been in three countries, this didn't happen in India, but in, uh, in Africa and Eastern Europe, where government ministers said to me, we don't think kids are blind should go to school. I mean, it's just very simple. Not, it wasn't, they weren't, weren't really debating it. So you're, in some cases, starting with those areas, or in some cases, starting with religious issues or issues of karma or other kind of beliefs. So we have to, we have to deal with those stigmatism. There's a, a woman I met in, um, in, a, in an Arab country who, she, she's blind and she didn't have a cane. And because if she had a cane, her brother would never get married because the belief in the village was that if she had a disability, they all the family would have a disability. So there's a lot of those issues to try to raise awareness as part of that, as part of the sustainability. Uh, Mantesh, I, you know, every time I meet you, you have yet another new program that you come up with. 
how do you find the resources for this? Or what are some of the innovative kind of sources to help you scale? Uh, you know, some interesting partnerships with the government. Uh, what what has Samarthanam done that helps it get to where it is? Thank you. Uh, so three major uh, focus of Samarthanam. One is uh, being innovative to the growth and three sustenance. <coughs> and uh, we keep adding new programs every now and then. Uh, so majorly what we do is we network and partner. Uh, like I mentioned about uh, the Srishti, the call center training, it's a public-private partnership. So uh, DFID, uh, international agency uh, funded Government of India under capacity building for poverty reduction, they funded uh, to set up several initiatives to poverty elevation. So they gave uh, part of the grant to Government of Karnataka, which they in turn routed it to Samarthanam. But that money was not uh, full. So what we did is we requested a couple of corporates and also Deshpande Foundation. Deshpande Foundation gave away the space which we inaugurated here. And a software company came forward and chipped in the balance. So Samarthanam, uh, in its uh, 16 years of uh, close to 16's journey, has uh, uh, built goodwill and uh, corporate partners and government uh, departments, uh, both departments which work for disability, uh, department for education and human resource. So we uh, work very closely with them and uh, with some of them we also discuss at a policy level. Uh, so uh, as a part of our advocacy initiatives, we keep organizing uh, several uh, events like the T20 World Cup and the National Chess Championship for the blind like this. So we invite uh, the bureaucrats and the corporate captains to be uh, guests and witness the happenings. So that is one of the selling strategy which Samarthanam has been very uh, consciously doing it. And uh, as Adam said, human resource is a big challenge. So what we do is we uh, extensively work on capacity building with the team in Samarthanam. Uh, and primarily, uh, it's my dream, uh, we should have as many visually impaired as possible as the marketing officers for Samarthanam who could themselves go and promote and propagate this. And also, I uh, tell my visually challenged folks that they should become the taxpayers of the country rather than depend on the doles of the government. So uh, some of these uh, thoughts which uh, we constantly talk about and uh, events we organize and uh, the reports we uh, send it to our stakeholders, annual reports, and uh, audit reports, abstract of the app, uh, audit reports, and the media. The major uh, development of Samarthanam or the growth has been huge support from the media, sir. So we don't shy away from media. We don't uh, uh, kind of keep ourselves away from publicity. We believe uh, if we can uh, uh, talk about Samarthanam, the good activities we are doing uh, in media and uh, through other promotions, we also display hoardings whenever when we organize events we liberally distribute flyers about the event so that way you kind of communicate uh, what you are doing to the mass so uh, neighborhood community support for samarthanam has been the major sustainability and uh, they go and talk to their companies bring money from their companies so like this so involvement of uh, um, uh, most people uh, from different walks has been one of our uh, success so hope I answered in brief, sir. No, thank you, thank you. So R Ramesh, uh, you know, obviously, thanks for sharing those couple of examples of starts that didn't work. Uh, I mean, now you're looking at uh, this new approach that you're going to be taking. How are you? Lo uh, so, what's the for-profit, non-profit kind of components over there? How are you all wor working with that? You know, the, how do you maintain a social mission while you're still trying to? I'm assuming a for-profit kind of scalable approach. Yeah, so our, our, uh, after talking to our mentors and, and talking to a lot of people, um, it, it was very clear that we have to set ourselves up for scalability because the problem is too huge and, and showing success in a, in a small segment or, or a small city will not, be, will not be enough. So that's our hypothesis. Uh, and the hypothesis is that if we co-opt the existing players uh, in this particular market, which is optical stores and, and, and doctors and ophthalmologists, if you give them enough tools to be powerful, they in turn will do the social uh, inclusion for us because they will continue to make profit down the line 
And when we talk to all the stakeholders, you know, all the way from uh, governments to big uh, aid organizations, to eyeglasses makers, to frame makers, to eye clinics and so on, uh, and they all said, uh, we'll be able to come up with a uh, flow of money so that the service is delivered to the people who cannot afford it. But, but show us that you can scale to tens of thousands and millions very quickly. So our goal is to reach those numbers and uh, we feel, at least that's how we feel right now, that rest of the money will follow, that will trickle down to people who can't even afford glasses or cataract screens. So, so yeah, Im immediate this thing to do like a pilot scale thing to show the scalability that's right. of what you're doing. That's right. We're still in the early stages.